1 Corinthians chapter 16, we are drawing to a close of this letter. Probably another week in it, uh, and the, we will begin uh, our next study. I'll mention that again at the end. 1 Corinthians 16, reading, reading verses 12 to 18. So if you'll stand with me and follow along in your Bibles. If you don't have your Bible, we'll have the text on the screen for you uh, so that you can see as well as hear the Word. We pick up in verse 12, which was a bridge verse. We looked at that last week. Now, concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brothers, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. And then here comes the admonitions. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Now, I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these, and to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Today, may the Lord help us to be challenged, strengthened. I noticed the songs that Joshua selected this morning are, are all a call to maturity. What, what growing in Christ looks like, should be like, the challenges we should respond to. May the Word of God do that to us today. And those of us who've been walking with the Lord uh, for decades... Put aside any temptation from the enemy of our souls to think that because of that reality that we can slack up. A preacher said to me years ago, he said, Brother, you better hope that you wear out before you rust out. That's what we need to do. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, we told you last week that a lot of this book has been in the form of, of rebuke and correction. He's pointing out problems. In fact, he has said in previous uh, verse, I'm, I'm not going to just stop by there on the way somewhere else. I want to come and spend some time there. And the reason was he needed to sort some things out. Here you move into uh, exhortation. Uh, it's an exhortation in the verses we're considering to, to be watchful, to to stand or be firm, to act like men, to be mature, to be strong, to be loving. We began looking at that last week. We looked at how in, in the call to be watchful, that, uh, that the Scripture teaches us several things. Be watchful against the devices of the devil. Peter said, be on your guard. Your adversary, the devil, is roaming around, resisting firm in the faith, and that's, that's sort of the next thing, isn't it? Stand firm. Uh, be alert for temptation. Yield not to temptation is a hymn uh, that we sing, for yielding is sin. Good distinction. Being tempted to sin is not sin. That's one of the devil's lies. Well, you were tempted. You might as well go ahead and yield because you're a hypocrite already. That's a lie. Jesus was in all ways, in every way. Think about every way you've ever been tempted. He was in all ways tempted as you are and I am, as we are. The difference being, he never yielded. We're to be on our alert against temptation, the clever, the clever tools of a threefold enemy, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world says, stop being so dogmatic. Come on, people. People are identifying as different things. Who are you to be so dogmatic to say there's, in the beginning, God made them male and female, and that's it, two, two and no more. I saw a meme this week of a personage looked like, looks like what you and I would recognize as a devil standing at the gates of heaven saying, but I identify as an angel. The response was, we don't play that here. 
Be alert to the temptations of the world, to your own flesh. Keep it under control, self-controlled, one of the fruit of the Spirit. Fourth, be alert for false teachers. Many exhortations about that in the Scriptures. Revelation 2 and 3, the letters to the seven churches. Some of those letters warn against false teachers. Test everything by the word. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. This is, this is if you want to know what is, what is at core wrong with this generation, is it's driven by its heart. That, that made me sad. That bothered me. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. We measure it by the word. We bring our minds, Romans 12 tells us, to subjection. Keep on having the mind renewed. You have feelings, but the feelings are always to be dictated to by, by truth, by reason, by biblical truth. We're to pray. He said that in Ephesians 6. We read that last week as our responsive reading. Praying always. You've got to be alert to pray. You think, well, I, I, surely the closer I get to Jesus, the easier it would be to be alert to pray. That's not what the disciples discovered in the garden where they fell asleep. Watch and pray, he said. To be alert for the return of Jesus Christ. I told you last Sunday. I can't prove this. I'm not going to write a book about it. But there's, but there's anecdotal evidence in the, in the last days of Jesus after he had risen from the grave that would lead us to consider that when he comes again, it'll be on the first day of the week. And he'll come for his church. He expects his church to be gathered, I promise you, under God. I'm still living when he comes. I want to be found with the people of God. I don't want to be found off doing my own thing, taking my ease, acting like the Lord's day is my day somehow. I don't want to challenge ourselves. Be alert. The second thing we considered was stand firm or be firm. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. We told you last week, firm in the faith is not the same as faithfully firm, standing firm. It, it means in the content, the body. There is a faith once for all delivered to the saints. It's being tampered with today. Always has been from enemies from the outside. But it's being tampered with today by people who have been friends from the inside. The gospel is the message of the eternal Son of God, the blessed second person of the Trinity, leaving the splendor of heaven, coming and being conceived in the womb of a virgin. Her name was Mary. In the fullness of time being born, living a sinless life, perfectly obeying the law of God. Some heretic this week I saw posted that, that Jesus had come to him and asked him to forgive him. That is blasphemy. A life of perfect obedience to the law of God. Never sinning. In the fullness of time, he surrenders himself. He gives himself up. He endures the wrath of God for sin. He bears your and my sin on the cross. He satisfies God's divine justice by his suffering and death in our place, in the place of everyone who will put their hope and faith and trust in him. He rises from the grave three days later, physically, bodily, and is ascended on high and is right now praying for all who've come to trust in him and for all who will come to trust in him. And when the last one of God's precious children has been brought to faith in Christ, when the last martyr has been executed for the faith, read, read Revelation, then he will come. A trumpet will sound. The skies will part, and he will come. This time not a gentle and lowly Messiah, this time as a conquering king, king of kings, lord of lords. And he will trample every enemy. He will destroy every pretense. He will come to rescue his people. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Never water it down. Don't add to it. Don't take from it. 
the faith. Paul said to Thessalonians, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. And he's not talking about how every year they, they hung greenery in the sanctuary. That's not the tradition he's talking about. He's talking about the truth delivered to him, that he spoke to them and that he wrote to them. Third, this is where we were last week, act like men. And it is, it is the word for men. It doesn't mean that women are allowed to be immature. It means that he recognizes that the, that the future of any congregation rests on men being mature Christian men. On our teaching our boys to grow to be young men. I read, again, I read an article yesterday where a recently added board member of Planned Parenthood, a wicked euphemism if ever there was one, is a transgender from, from biological female to identifying as a man. And what is this person doing on the board of, trans, of, of Planned Parenthood? Arguing to make sure, hang on now, that men have abortion rights. We are sick unto death, people. And I promise you, I walk, and when I get up in the morning and walk out and look up in the sky, and fire and brimstone and sulfuric ash is not falling down upon this nation, I am amazed at the incredible mercy and long-suffering of God. Act like men. We began to look at that last week. What does that mean? It's, a, it's the idea of, of courage. We read Joshua 1. Be strong and courageous. Don't wimp out, men. Lead. If you're struggling with what it looks like to lead, we're going through an excellent study on Sunday night it's called Love and Respect. If when we finish that you want to do further study, we can commend to you by means of Right Now Media, the men's fraternity material that we've gone through several times here. It doesn't work to fly by the seat of our pants with what constitutes a man. He told them in chapter 14, verse 20, and they're thinking to be mature. Think mature. Grow in thinking. He says, when he writes in chapter 3, when I was with you, I wasn't able to talk to you as spiritual men, as mature men, but, but as men of flesh, as babes in Christ. See, he's making a distinction here. Question I have to ask, how do you receive the Word of God? How do you respond to God's reproof? How do you respond to God's rebuke? How do you respond to difficult providences? How do you not only respond, because it's not just respond, how do you initiate gospel ministry, gospel speech, gospel engagement. A passive Christian man is an oxymoron, a contradiction of terms. He doesn't say feel like men. He doesn't even say just think like men. Act like men. Engage. Engage your home. Lead your home. Love your wife. Be loving toward her. We're learning, learning a lot of good things about this on Sunday nights. I can't commend this class too strongly. You say, well, I'm way behind. Good news is right now media has every one of these. You can catch up before you know it. Be loving toward your wife, your children. When the children leave the home, be, be loving toward your grandchildren. Show them. Show them what a man, a good-willed man, a man worthy of respect, looks like, acts like, talks like. Be mature, he says. Maturity, according to 1 Corinthians 13, is one of the marks of love. How, does, how do we know we love the Lord? How do we know we love one another? It comes through, men, in our growing in grace. It comes through as the fruit of the Spirit is, is born more and more mightily. Now, the women don't get off the hook here because, you see, the men lead. 
the men model this. When, and in too many places, the women have had to step forward and lead because the men have completely capitulated. I have not found that true here, but I can tell you, I've been in a place or two where that was the case. God changed it mercifully. One thing I found is that men who know the Lord Jesus Christ, when called to rise up, when called to step up, if they, if they really know Christ, that reverberates within them. And they may not know how initially, but it, but it strikes a chord. It, it, it fans a flame because God is the one who made us male and female. And so act like men. Paul says it this way in Ephesians 4, 13, and, and, and verse 13 and 15, until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way unto him who is the head into Christ. And so you see the picture there? Mature manhood with mature womanhood following on its heels. That's why the subtitle of these, this particular sermons the last week, this week, is it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. It's, it's a tragic thing when you, when you observe a person who would have you believe that they have walked with the Lord Fill in the blank. 10 years, 15 years, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And the longer they serve him. See, there's a, there's a wonderful song that came out of the Gaither uh, cantata, Alleluia. The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. The more I love him, more love he bestows. Each day is like heaven. My heart overflows. It's tragic when you see a person who might like that song, like that cantata, who would have to say, the longer I serve him, the colder I grow. The longer I serve him, the more cantankerous I become. It just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. If every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before, then every day with Jesus should make me love him more and be sweeter still. You can't find every day with Jesus being sweeter than the day before and see your own personal sourness increasing. Something wrong. You're not heeding the admonition to be mature. Of course, the Word is the primary means for this. We feed upon the, that sincere milk of the Word. You never, you never outgrow that. That's the thing. Joshua mentioned it. You know, one of the dangers is that we ever get to the point in the Christian life where we feel like, I got this. No, no, no. The more you grow, the more you mature, you realize God has got this. And God has got me. There is hope, therefore, that this too will prove to be an opportunity for me to glorify him, to exalt Jesus Christ to advance the gospel and to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a whole lot of a mouthful. It's not as easy and cliche as I got this, but it is biblically true, and I got this is not biblically true. It's the first step down the path of independence, of self-reliance. Paul confesses, if you understand what he was saying in 2 Corinthians about the thorn in the flesh, he confesses that something was going on in his life where he was tempted. Either, either he was aware he was tempted or just discovered that that's why God brought it. There was a thorn in the flesh given to him so that he not become puffed up and boastful, self-reliant. Realize he depended. We sang it in a song a while ago that, that I discovered when I am weak, then he is strong. Be mature. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, you know this well. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. It's all profitable. All has value because it's God-breathed for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Why? 
purpose statement, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That's the language of maturity, not lacking, equipped for every good theological debate, no. for every good work, the engaging in the home, the engaging in the neighborhood, the engaging in the, in the workforce, the engaging in the marketplace, the engaging in the culture, every good work. First and foremost, working out my own salvation with fear and trembling. In men's fraternity, we learned that an authentic or biblically nurtured, biblically grounded man is one who rejects passivity, accepts responsibility, leads courageously, expects a better reward, that is, God's reward. The definition of authentic biblical manhood. You reject passivity, then you will never think that you can be passive as a follower of Jesus Christ, that you must act like a man. Accepts responsibility, which of course, if you, once, you, once you put aside passivity, then, then you look at your plate and responsibilities come and you accept them. You lead courageously. And you don't live for this moment Wow, he was really in the moment. I think Jesus wants us to really be in eternity. That's how we're to live. I just want to be in the moment. Well, you should pay attention. You should be present when you're, when you're ministering to your wife and your children. And when you're engaged. But, but that's a whole lot of difference than, than what's talked about today. No. You expect a better reward. You don't measure the satisfaction in life, the success in life, by how good life and those around you are making you feel. Because you're acting like a man. You expect a better reward, God's reward. You're living to hear not the praise of people now. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your salvation. Yeah, maybe sometimes when there's not joy. David lost it. Re restore to me the joy of your salvation. Enter into the joy of your salvation. And so we act like men. And when we do that, women take note. If, if Emerson Egrich has made any point clear in this study, it is men, and it's, this is not the motive to do it. Men, if you will be loving toward your wife, you will be stunned and how she is stirred to show respect toward you. You don't do it so that she respects you, but it's a, it's the, it's a dynamic dance that Christians do in the gospel. Fourth, be strong. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men. Be strong. It's a word here. It speaks of inner spiritual growth. He doesn't say be tough. Well, I'm tough. You know, sometimes being strong means that, that you're tender in situations. Inner spiritual growth. In fact, the word here is it's different. It's be strengthened. Place yourself in a position for the Lord to strengthen you. You don't even, you don't even muster it up yourself. The Lord stirs this up. We cannot strengthen ourselves. That's the Lord's work. We is, submit him to him. We submit ourselves to him so that he can be strong. Look at Ephesians 6.10. We read this last week again. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now, we, when we went through Ephesians, we unpacked this just real quickly. Be strengthened in the Lord. Passive and in the strength of his might. Paul begins to ransack the Greek New Testament for words related to power. You see how diametrically opposed that is to, I got this. No, God's got this. And I must, I must make sure God's got me. If God's got this and God's got me, then this is going to be okay. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 1, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It's only as we purpose to be strong 
And we do not give in to the weakness of the flesh. We do not give in to the, to the spirit of the age. We do not give in to wrong notions of what it means to be a man. It's only as we're strengthened in the Lord, the strength of his might, the grace that is in Christ Jesus, that we can stand firm, defend ourselves and those whom we love against the wiles of the devil. Paul has said in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, let him who thinks he stands beware lest he fall. It's the, the picture there I told you then is of the man who thinks he stands straight and tall. It's the, it's the puffed out chest. It's the, it's the arrogant man. He says, you think you stand like that? Be careful because you have turned to self-reliance and the devil has got you in his sights. You need to walk humbly. What's the Lord required of you? To practice justice. To love mercy. And to do all of this walking humbly before your God. He says in Colossians 1, 10 and 11, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened, there it is again, passive, with all power according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. And so I have to check myself every now and then. I see, am I, am I manifesting an endurance? Am I manifesting a patience, a long-suffering? And, and is joy the, the juice that's driving me? If it's not, then I'm not doing what Paul exhorts the Colossians to do. Paul could say to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.12, I thank him who's given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointed me to his service. Paul recognized where the strength came from. And you and I must too, we must be pur purposeful never to cut that line, never to move from that. I'm wearing a monitor now. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm turning into something of a cyborg. But you know something? This won't do me any good if I leave this at home. This must be within 30 feet of this or the folks monitoring me 24-7 won't know what's going on. And I think if I understand the material right, they'll get hold of me somehow. Say so we've lost connection. Brothers and sisters, we've got to think like that as Christians. Do not lose the connection. Fifth, be loving. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. This is not as obvious here. Let all that you do be done in love. But that be done in love is another verb of command. All that you do. Well, can I be loving sometimes? No. All that you do. Well, does there never any... Uh, all that you do be done in love. Agape love. See, love, as we saw in 1 Corinthians 13, complements and balances everything else. Be, so that when you're alert, you're not alert to other people's faults and sins and shortcomings. You're alert to what's going on with you. When you're standing firm in the faith, you're not looking down your nose at those who are not. When you're acting like a man, you, have, you haven't fallen into some machismo madness. Think that bravado is spirituality. When you're strengthened, you don't think it's your strength. You know it's God's strength. All be done in love. Love balances everything. Love, one writer said, is, has a softening effect. It takes off the rough edges of a man. Not to make him less of a man, but to make him a more mature, godly man. Paul said that love is what the Corinthians needed most. Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, Keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. I've told you this before. He is not saying that if you'll be loving, then you, you can just, people ought to overlook my sin. No, no, no. Love is the blanket that you throw on other people in their sins. You and I are to be ruthless, ruthless with our sin, but loving toward others. Love covers a multitude of sins. It comes from the Lord, 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever is loving, watch the, watch the 
verb tenses here. Whoever is loving has been born of God and is knowing God. There's a sequence. Only people who do this are folks who have been born again. It's the fruit of that. John goes on to say that the only way we're able to love and to love one another is because we were first loved by God. And then finally, I want to wrap this up in the sixth place, recognizing those who are calling you to maturity. It says here in verses 15 to 18, Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanas were the first converts in Achaia and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. What a great commendation. What, what would be said of you? What's your, what's your epithet? They were converts. And they didn't go around telling, well, you know, we are charter members here. You do know that, don't you? We were, we were the first people to believe. All, all the rest of you pagans had to catch it. That, that wasn't the attitude at all. They devoted themselves with servant hearts. That's their commendation to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as these. In other words, you ought to, you ought to want to learn from them. We don't need to learn from folks who are part-time Christians, part-time church members. They've got nothing to contribute to us because there's no part-time heaven. I want you to learn from people who are faithful, people you can, you can look for, you can count on. That's who you learn from. I wouldn't care if a fellow had 10 seminary degrees. He can't teach me anything. Just like the Pope can't teach me one lick about marriage. Okay? Learn from those that are doing it. Learn from those that are doing it. That's what he's saying here. Be subject to such as these and to every fellow worker and laborer. You know, Paul never had a super abundance of folks laboring with him. He, he some, says at some point, everyone's abandoned me. How sad. But it's true. When, you, when you've been in ministry 45 years here, you know, that I, as, as I have, uh, yeah, you experience that. And it breaks your heart. But you're not alone. If, if the fellow that wrote half the New Testament can say that, then we need to put our big boy pants on and realize it's going to happen to you too. Be subject as to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus. So, so this Steph Stephanus, whose household was original followers of Christ there, uh, have, has come with a delegation of Fortunatus and Achaicus, and he said, they made up for your absence. What's he saying here? He says, I miss you. I miss you. Now, you may or may not believe this. When Karen and I travel and, and we find ourselves gone on Sundays and we, we attend somewhere else, even if I'm preaching in that place, I miss here. I miss here. Because you're my family. You're my family. He says, they came, and it was for Paul, it was kind of like a, a little reunion with the church at Corinth. They brought him word. They told him what was going on. It's prompted the writing of this letter, no doubt. And even though he's had to scold them at many points, he's, he, he doesn't hate them. He doesn't despise them. If you wondered that throughout the letter, this settles it. They made up for your absence. Seeing them gave me a little taste of seeing all of you, of being with you. He says, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. It's interesting there. They refreshed his spirit. You get that. That's pretty, pretty easy. We come from Corinth. Oh, bless your hearts. So good to see you. Well, tell me, what's going on? What's going on in the church? And then they tell him, and, and it probably caused him to weep and and he, he writes a letter that's got some pretty scathing rebuke in it. But, but oh, the, the, his bottom line to their visit is not, I was so disappointed to hear what's happening. I cannot believe, I wonder if I've wasted my time there. That's not his attitude at all. 
Now come and refresh my spirit. And it says, as well as yours. Now, if the commentators are different, fall differently in terms of what's he saying here. But he's saying, I hope that you sent them, your sending of them was out of your regard for me. And you should be refreshed. And when he, when he writes this letter, send it back, that, that I'm coming, what they're coming back with will ultimately be a refreshing of you. You see, Paul believed the Proverbs, faithful are the wounds of a friend. The kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The Bible warns, beware of the flatterer. And then he closes this section, give recognition to such people. And he's not saying, this is a, this is a compound word. He's not saying, oh, I, I know you. That's, you're Stefan. I know you, Stefan. I recognize, no. The, here, the picture here, the idea is he's used it before in Corinth to recognize uh, the commands that he's given them. It is to respect them. You see, when they come to Paul, they become his fellow laborers. They become extensions of the ministry of Paul. That's how he used all the folks that came to him, all the folks that journeyed with him, and he said to them, you show respect for them. Respect what they're doing. We live in a culture of disrespect. I've never seen, I've lived through good presidents, bad presidents, I've never seen a culture so completely, vocally disrespectful to our leaders. The president's not a perfect guy, I don't think he's a Christian. Some folks do. I'm not the Holy Spirit, so it's not my call. But I mean relentlessly, 24-7. So you're growing up in a culture that has no respect. You're growing up in a culture, young people, young people, you're growing up in a culture where yeah has replaced yes, ma'am, yes, sir, no, ma'am, no, sir. Rare is the child that when you speak to them as an adult, did you get a yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, yeah, what? It's a culture of disrespect. Paul says, respect these people. Now let me hear when I come back that you've gotten jealous, because Corinth was full of jealousy. And so he was anticipating that when these folks came back and talked about the time they spent with Paul, that some people, well, I guess you're, you're Paul's pet then, aren't you? Well, they went at great uh, disadvantage and inconvenience to travel to see him. They didn't get there by cruise ship. Wasn't one of the destination adventures. Paul says, respect them. Recognize them. Recognize them. And that needs to happen in a church. Paul warned the Corinthians against arrogance. He tells them that that they need to recognize those who labor in the Word. The Scripture teaches that. Hebrews 13, 17. We'll close with this. We're out of time. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. That is bone-chilling for a leader to read. Whatever you think I think about this, that, and the other, know that I never stray far from this reality. That one day I will give an account for my time among you. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning. For that would be of no advantage to you. Why? Why? Because you too will give an account with what you have done in relationship to the Lord's servants through the years. A man arguably more able than me preceded me and was horribly mistreated by people. 
And those people will give an account to God for how they related to and treated and respected and honored God's servant. Never forget that. It will be of no advantage to you. When you read a passage like this, there's not a person who has ears to hear that should not respond with fear and trembling. And I promise you, I fear and I tremble more than all of you. Paul's word is clear. And he's going to launch into the next section. In verses 19 to 24, with life in a gospel community. Just, just give a brief sketch. And that is why, as I was reading through this letter time and time and time again, that it became obvious to me that if we're going to heed the package of 1 Corinthians, then we need to study the one another's in Scripture. Life in community. The each other's in Scripture. And I want to challenge you to do something. I hadn't asked you to do this in the 14 years I've been here. I want you to get your Bibles, your concordances, your devices. Begin to do a search for one another, each other, others. Jot down the texts. And I want you to send them to me. I mean, I know where they are. I'm looking at them in Scripture. I want, I want to make sure we don't miss any. You can do that for me. You can help. We can have an interactive sermon series. You can help feed the Scripture passages because we're going to go through God being our helper, the one another's of Scripture. And you can't engage those. If you're singing Three Dog Nights, one is the loneliest number. You've got to be engaged. One another. Each other. Others. I challenge you to do that so that we can learn together what life in a gospel community should look like. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we bow before you in Jesus' name and thank you. Oh, we thank you for your word. Help us to take to heart these uh, five verbs of command. Lord, it's easy to get sleepy, yet you have called to us to be alert. It's easy to back down. You've called us to stand firm in the faith. We don't want to be seen as troublemakers. We don't want to be seen as bigots and racists and xenophobes and homophobes. But dear God, help us to stand firm in the faith. Help those of us who are men to act like biblically nurtured, biblically grounded men, to reject passivity, to accept responsibility, to lead courageously, and to not find our fulfillment primarily in this world, but to look for the reward, the future grace, the promise that there is laid up in heaven a crown for the righteous, for all those who fight the fight, who finish the course, who keep the faith. And Lord, help us to be the people you would have us to be. Help us to be the people you'd have us to be. To wrap it all in love. Love for God. Love for others. Love for one another. Love for a lost and dying world. Your word, applied by your spirit, can increasingly conform us to be such people. So hear our prayer today and answer for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.